Caroline is based at the IP Law Unit at, at UCT, um, and we have with us in the discussion Lucy Abrahams, who's based at the Link Center at WITS. I'm sure many of you know Lucy. Um, we also have with us Von Vossen Belete from the International Creativity and Development Services in Ethiopia, and Joko Ala Ama from the University of Botswana. Welcome. And yes, yes. Um, before we begin, though, I wanted to say thank you very much to Titani and to present to your research outfits. We hope that they'll be very helpful to Nipmo. Thank you so much. All right. Whilst one of my panelists is setting up, I'm just going to do a brief walkthrough for this session. So our agenda is twofold. We want to engage with the presentation that we've just heard, but we also want to share our own research outputs with you and our own case studies. And so what I'm going to do is to run a series of questions um, by my panel. Um, the first thing I want to hear from them is their immediate response to the key point. So I want you to hold back on your case studies and just engage for now. There has been some engagement from the floor, but I know that you might have different insights. And the way I wanted you to frame your response is to say, what is your gut response to the key point and to link that to your own case study. So tell us what aspects of that key point your case study resonates with. Um, if it's a matter of contradicting that key point or confirming it, we'd love to hear it. And so, Lucy, um, just to speak to you about our book chapters before uh, perhaps we engage so you know where our insights are coming from. Um, we are the authors of three book chapters, um, starting with chapter 13, which focuses on South Africa, co-authored by Lucy and I. Then there's a chapter that deals with Botswana, which is authored by Prof. Ama, and there's a chapter on Ethiopia written by Benete. So we'll speak to the key point from that perspective. Lucy, please go ahead. Um, well, you, you did ask for gut reaction, Caroline. Yes, yeah. And I, I was just amazed by um, uh, how much money it takes to earn so little. Two, two comma three million rand, was, was that the figure from commercialization? I think the reality is that um, commercialization from, from a position of scientists working in universities is very, very difficult. The money is not going there. The money is going into administration of bureaucracy. The money is not going into the productive aspect of commercialization. OK, my, my response to um, the issue of uh, the IP, the SSIP that has been discussed, um, is that um, that's what some of us are looking forward to, especially in our country, Botswana. Unfortunately, we don't yet, we haven't got to that stage. But I think it's, no, it's okay. but I think it's um, uh, a, a right way forward. Uh, it doesn't matter how, like my, the last speaker did point out, uh, it doesn't matter how small the, uh, the take home is, but the important thing is that something is happening and that if you have uh, spent some time and effort to develop something, uh, there should be a reward. I think that's my uh, response to that. Thank you. Mm, okay, thank you. Uh, the point which I would like to make is that uh, science, technology, and innovation policy in general and IP policy in particular should be based on the specific technological, social, economic, and cultural situations of the country in which it's going to be applied. So in many African countries, the policies which are designed, for example, in the case of the IP law which is applied in South Africa, those which are designed in the developed countries, if they are adapted to the specific situations of the countries, it may be okay. Otherwise, if they are just simple copies of the policies in the advanced countries in which the conditions are uh, completely different, it may be a problem. That's the reaction to Okay. Um, I was just trying to assimilate those gut responses as they came by. So I had a number of things. I heard money, right? Um, the bottom line matters. Um, Lucy's concern is that if South Africa is only earning 2.3 million after spending, I don't know, 10 times that much, um, it's perhaps not worth it. Um, but Prof. Ama, on the other hand, said something to the effect that um, as long as whatever legal is coming in, that's okay, right? So directly contesting viewpoints, I think. Um, I'll leave them with you um, to mull over. And um, Belete ended up by saying that um, he's talking about legal transplants, right? So essentially, for those of you who are not aware, 
um, the South African Act, if you like, is the biodiesel transplant into South Africa. Um, and so Belletta's point is, if we're going to be transplanting pieces of legislation from the developed to the developing world, well then, we need to use Prof. Sihanya's word to calibrate, right? To make it fit our environment. And so that's just our gut response as we're starting. Um, I'm now going to ask the speakers to then go back to their case studies and tell us a bit more, but to always keep in mind the key point and to further engage as things go along. Um, I will try to work it out that at the end we'll have 10 minutes of engagement with the floor. Um, and when that happens, I'm hoping that there'll be engagement with the key point and engagement with the case studies. So we'll start with the case studies. Um, Lucy is going to begin with the South African case study. Um, but we did look at two universities, at UCT and at WITS, and I think there's something that has to be said about that, that these two universities are really not representative of the 23 universities that the previous speaker referred to. They are representative mostly of themselves and another four universities, so at most of six of the 23 universities in the system. However, they are very important to look at because um, they are effectively um, the main um, users of funding resources. Um, uh, as you will see here, the South African R&D input um, is in the region of 24 billion rand per year in terms of R&D input, but the innovation component of that input might be significantly less, okay, because some of that R&D money is paying for research that will never be commercialized, and there's no intention even from government that it should be commercialized. So we still need to get behind all of those metrics. There's a lot of metrics there that we have to understand. Um, so about 20%, so, sorry, um, is someone moving my slides for me? <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening. Um, OK. Um, so of that 24 billion, about 20% is spent in universities, mainly in six universities. And as I said, the, the, the component that is intended for innovation is significantly smaller. So we're looking at a percentage of 2.4 billion rand. Um, there is the overarching um, open air research question. This theme is publicly funded research. And we were interested in understanding how the IPR Act affects um, uh, collaborative research, innovation, and scholarly publishing. And we had to select particular disciplines. Um, and in the process, what we found was that the health and engineering disciplines appear to be the largest users of these funds. So you'll notice that we keep narrowing down who is actually using this money to do R&D and innovation. Um, we were curious about a few things. We were curious about the possible chilling effect of the legislation on, um, uh, on research production and particularly on scholarly publishing. A few other things like uncertainty about the exercise of state walking rights. In other words, if, um, if, uh, if there was non-compliance, let's say, um, could the state just come in and say, well, that's our IP? Um, because those are some of the issues that are set up in the legislation. But I think this is really the, the central and the most important slide that's in front of us. Um, these are our findings. That the, there's enormous complexity in the IPR regulation of publicly funded research. That um, if you look at the, the diamond in the center of the diagram, um, if we're thinking about this kind of IP generation from a knowledge economy perspective, what we see is a nexus between patenting, open access dissemination, and open access publishing. That's just a very simple view of the situation. Um, the, the nature of those interconnections is, is very, very complex, and there are, there are uh, scientists who have really uh, educated themselves significantly about the legislation in order to simultaneously pursue uh, 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 patenting as well as um, uh, uh, publishing under copyright as well as publishing under open access. So a, a very small research teams at particular universities have been able to develop um, significant skills beyond their knowledge of a field, like chemical engineering or like pharmaceutical engineering, um, in order to deal with this world of patenting. But clearly, this cannot apply 
to all universities. It's just a level of capacity um, that I think we would be foolish to imagine could become uh, commonplace uh, in anything less than something between 20 and 30 years. In any event, um, if I go to the, the, the bottom um, block of the diagram, um, we have to note that publicly funded research is, doesn't exist. There is always a combination of public and private funding. There is very little research, and I'm certainly not aware of any research that is exclusively publicly funded. Just because the amounts of public funding are way too small to do any serious long-term research. The kind of research that is exclusively publicly funded will usually be, you know, kick off kind of. Uh, let's kick off this program. Let's do something that, you know, um, where there's been no development yet. Um, and, and, and that might be exclusively publicly funded. But when we're talking about multi-million rand programs, we're talking about a combination of funding. And um, here we do see that the regulatory procedures may or do uh, delay negotiation, conclusion, implementation of contract, uh, contracts um, for private sector funding. Um, at some point in the early days of the introduction of the legislation, it was a small but significant loss of industry contract research income, but, but that, that did correct itself. Moving on, we don't have time unfortunately, but moving on, um, crucial issues are not only about human resource capacity to operate within the frame of the act, but institutional capacity. I think to say that the OTT offices is great, but what is the capacity of those TT officers and the institutions? Because it's not the whole purpose cannot be prosecuted by TTO officers alone. It's a, it's a major institutional paradigm shift, not just the establishment of a TTO. And then coming to the, the top uh, 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 um, block there is um, what is actually going with on with R&D and patenting is that we found a very high degree of adaptability. Um, in this particular case study. But I think uh, we did not draw the conclusion that these levels of adaptability and uh, 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 fostering of both copyright and open uh, publishing um, could be generalized to, to other institutions, uh, not even necessarily to other research intensive universities. And then just to end the last block, um, the... Um, the legislation itself uh, appears not to have had a chilling effect on, on publishing. Um, and in fact, scientists have recommended, uh, perhaps not yet to their institutions, but have adopted an approach um, between the scientist and the, and the IP office uh, to look at forward planning and to understand and sort of uh, um, technologize, I suppose, the, um, the, the process so that there isn't too much conflict between patenting um, uh, and declarations and applications and the, the patenting side of the business and the publishing side of the business. And they've tried to, to shorten the time uh, between those two events. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do is to ask the author of the next book chapter um, in this um, area, which is uh, Who is Belete, to talk to us about the Ethiopian case study. But if you will, before you do the Ethiopian case study, would you perhaps locate yourself um, in relation to the South African Act. So we want to know how far along the path you are yes. and anything along those lines. OK, thank you. Uh, the presentation, the case study on uh, South Africa was based on an existing system. And what they did was examining the different aspects of that system. But when we come to Ethiopia, uh, the research relates to something which is proposed, actually. It was not yet being implemented, but it was proposed in the National Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy. The specific uh, strategy which relates to intellectual property in the national STI policy is about the building of uh, national and institutional intellectual property systems. And the institutional intellectual property system refers to the uh, institutional IP policies and the establishment of a technology transfer offices in the different universities in Ethiopia. 
The STI policy is based on a national innovation systems approach, and it tries to propose something, or the strategies are related to the strengthening of the interaction between the main innovation actors. Uh, these actors are universities, uh, firms, uh, government research institutes, and some research uh, making bodies. And there are also some uh, framework conditions which are identified in the science, technology, and innovation policy. One of each, is one of uh, the strategies is uh, there is a, an IP system which was functioning, but it was not. It's not strong. So strengthening that IP system is one of the strategies. Financing of innovation is also addressed in the science and technology policy. For example, national quality infrastructure building is also another of the framework conditions. But the Ethiopian study was specifically focusing on the intellectual property system. Uh, in order to examine the applicability of such a policy strategy in Ethiopia. We tried to review the existing laws, which have some provisions relating to university industry linkage. And we also administered a questionnaire, a questionnaire actually three different questionnaires to policy makers, university researchers, and industry managers. Uh, the responses which we obtained from the three different groups are different. The two groups actually do have uh, more or less similar responses. I mean, the industry uh, managers and the university researchers. But the response from the policy makers is more mainly influenced by the uh, practices in the developed countries. And they are pushing for the emulation of policies which are implemented in the advanced countries without having a detailed understanding about the systems. So, there is a very limited understanding about IP-related issues among the policy makers in Ethiopia. Uh, the industry managers, they do have some better understanding about the technical issues. And the university professors, especially those who are in the law faculties, since there are courses on IP, they are uh, better positioned to give some important uh, inputs to, they were better positioned to give important inputs to our studies. So if I try to just put the responses from the two groups uh, in a clear statements, what they want is the university researchers should get some incentive for what they are doing. But that incentive scheme should not be one which hampers the transfer of university-generated knowledge to industry. Another finding of our study was that the policy was based on some uh, prior studies uh, conducted by the Ethiopian Intellectual Property Office, by the Ministry of Science and Technology, and by a project which was financed by the Swedish government. And in all those studies, the proposal was for copying the policies, especially the Bible Act of the USA, and they emphasized encouraging the commercialization of university research to industry. While in actual fact, the problem in Ethiopia is very little research in the universities which can be transferred to industry. So the prior emphasis should be on building the research capacity of the universities rather than focusing on the commercialization of the knowledge through intellectual property. So more or less the main findings are these ones, but if there are questions, you can interact and explain some points further. Okay. Um, thank you. Before allowing the floor to ask you any follow-up questions, I'd like to give Pope Ama an opportunity to answer, uh, to give us an overview of his own case study. Before doing that, I wanted just to highlight um, that in the survey of Ethiopian um, informants, um, you say that um, they seem to be limited understanding amongst policymakers, which reminds me of what Prof. Sihanya said in the morning. You know, he said, our legislators our legislators just don't get it, and mm -hmm. this is what you're finding as well. Um, Prof. Ama surveyed um, academics at the University of Botswana, and we're very keen to find out how high or low um, levels of awareness are amongst those academics in Botswana. Please go ahead, Prof. Ama. Uh, let me just say, uh, it gives me real pleasure to uh, be in the midst of um, learned 
uh, individuals. Uh, of course, I belong to the most learned. <laughs> uh, I'm a statistician by profession, and um, one would wonder what I have to do with uh, IP. But that is not to say I, I did a, a case study which actually is titled Perspectives on Intellectual Property from Botswana's public uh, funded researchers. And the researchers we are, we are looking at were really those from institutions and uh, uh, parastatus industry and so on and so forth. And of course, um, the major question that I attempted to answer was uh, uh, the potential impact. What, are, what is the potential impact of uh, Botswana's IP legal and policy environment on three components, dissemination, utilization, and commercialization of knowledge generated from publicly funded uh, research. Uh, it was purely quantitative uh, uh, in, 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 term to, in terms of the study, and um, uh, I pursued it in, uh, in this manner, uh, first of all looking at Botswana and uh, uh, STI status, uh, uh, to recognize the fact that uh, Botswana is signatory to both global instruments and uh, uh, African instruments, uh, IP instruments. Um, and then uh, went on to actually look at uh, the universities. Of course, at the time of the study, the uh, University of Botswana was uh, the main university <laughs> Uh, existing. The other ones were just uh, trying to start up. It's a little bit uh, uh, different right now. Uh, but one thing that is certain is that uh, most of the other universities do not even have a, an IP policy. The University of Botswana does, and um, uh, it uh, allows a 50-50 a uh, division uh, in terms of uh, whatever is generated, uh, whatever resources are generated as a result of uh, the IP. Um, the other thing we did, I've said already that the study was basically quantitative and uh, of course um, one of some of the major findings were that um, uh, there is lack of uh, knowledge amongst the researchers uh, of the prevailing legal and uh, policy frameworks that govern IP at both the institutional and national levels. And the uh, majority of the uh, researchers were unaware of the contents of, of those policies even where they existed. And of course, you, the lack of knowledge have uh, um, sort of uh, uh, affected or, uh, or rather hindered IP development and may have been contributory to the low usage of IP rights. Uh, the other uh, findings, of course, uh, was also that the lack of knowledge and about commercialization uh, of research output from publicly funded research indicates that most of the researchers uh, uh, have actually failed to engage with the institutional uh, IP policies. Uh, it is also good to remark, uh, though not uh, good enough, uh, to say that Botswana has very low level of patenting. Uh, and this lack of, of course, uh, can also affect. Um, so when we talk about commercialization, uh, what is it actually that we are commercializing? Uh, the things that don't exist. Uh, so uh, I feel that uh, the way forward is to attempt to create awareness uh, of IP and its utility in generating value from uh, research outputs. And of course, this is a key area that requires uh, uh, immediate attention. Um, uh, the quality of research base, the research environments, 
uh, are all important in uh, enhancing uh, how much people can go into innovative processes. So it is thus important that an, an academic environment is created uh, which uh, uh, includes uh, more or less uh, uh, a reduction in the teaching load availability and accessibility of researches, research re uh, resources. Uh, all this will enhance uh, 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 innovation in one way or the other. Thank you. Um, I just want to maybe comment on the, the amount of money put in and the amount of revenue received. It should be take, taken into consideration that we are only measuring revenue received from 2 August 2010. So it's a very short time period for generating intellectual property and commercializing it. So we're fairly proud of that 2.3 million in three years, from literally from generation to output. We understand that there's a lot of money that's got to go into setting up a legislation and a framework like this. And we want to also say that a lot of that money is going into, as the professor said, into educating the researchers on the implications of IP and how it works within a research environment. Thanks. Hi, I'm Andrew Renz. I'm currently based at Duke University. And I have a passing familiarity with the IPR Act. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I, I want to um, ask all three of the panelists um, whether they've encountered um, in their work the ethic, any ethical considerations being taken into account by universities in how they uh, manage IP. Because uh, we have the example of Yale University. Students found out that Yale co-owned a patent which um, controlled access, or which controlled uh, um, access to medicines, which affected the access to medicines of people in Africa, um, people suffering from HIV. And the students protested that the patent, which was co-owned by Yale, was um, being used in a way which resulted in denial of access to medicines. After some student protests and after uh, some wealthy parents decided that they were going to support the students. Yale changed their behavior, and as a result, the pharmaceutical companies who co-owned the patents also had to change their behavior. So here we see an ethical dimension being taken on by the universities. Have any of you encountered this in, in the African context? And if it hasn't been raised, one might wonder why it hasn't been raised. We certainly didn't encounter in our research these the, 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 the kind of ethical issue that you raise, Andrew. Um, perhaps that was because of what disciplines we, or what projects we studied. That the projects were of such a nature that they perhaps uh, didn't engage directly with the users of um, the research output. Okay. But there was a, 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 an ethical issue which I think is, is very important to to put out in, 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 on a public platform. And that is um, the question of who is evaluating whom. So in the one particular case study, it was found that the researchers are really the top researchers in their field in South Africa. There is no other expertise in this particular area of R&D and innovation. But they would then be evaluated. And they were asking, well, who's going to be evaluating us? We are the experts. And we are, we are not just local experts. We are international experts, OK, uh, by definition of the field in which we are working. So I think that raises perhaps a different kind of ethical issue. But I think it suggests to us that there are many ethical issues which are hidden. Thanks. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Zakaris. I'm from Ethiopia. Uh, my question is with regard to the first presenter. When you mentioned about uh, there is no as such publicly funded res uh, research, rather it is a PPP, public private partnership. But my concern is, aren't we losing our focus when we, sh we consider from the interest of the, pub the public and the private? These are the private companies will be interested in market driven. Uh, in, innovations or products, where at the government, especially in the medicine area, where there are in, in Africa, we have many neglected diseases and so on and so forth. 
So how can we reconcile this kind of um, difference in interest? Also? My response is that I, I'm not sure that it is possible to separate public and private funding for research because it's an ecosystem. It's a, it's a system where many things are connected. And um, the other factor is that there is a relatively small um, envelope of public funding uh, for a very large researcher scientist population who are all competing. And so one of the problems with that is that I'm not saying that you divide the envelope you know, the funding envelope by the size of the population, obviously there's competition. But even with competition, the amount of funding that any uh, team of researchers can get is very small. And so if you want to carry on your research agenda, you have to find multiple forms of funding um, in order to even pursue uh, quite a small piece of work. Um, yeah, I, I think that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to push a little bit on Andrew's earlier question about ethics, um, and that has to do with um, the funding priorities of funders and how the conflicts between industry and, and science are managed. Because I, I think that, as you mentioned, there, there are multiple levels of the ethics problem. Um, but it's one thing to say, we want to make this research available um, on an open license or a humanitarian license. But I think it's a radically different thing to look at the ethics of compromised scientific research when there is no capacity um, to monitor what is being privately funded from what is being publicly funded. That strikes me as fairly critical because one of the things, certainly um, in the biological sciences, one of the things that has been problematic in Africa has been the application of therapeutic um, or even diagnostic um, medicines that have had no regulatory or um, human testing. And the side effects, given the differences in temperature and environment and diet, um, have been quite drastic. So when we think about this ethics issue, there are real consequences for the failure to monitor what private sector drives into the universities, which is completely often um, concerned with getting the IP rights, and what the public um, funded research is designed to do, which is to really broaden um, the nature of knowledge. So I'm just wondering, I, I want to push you a little bit on that, because I think it's a bit more complex than your earlier response may have suggested. I think the, the, your question is fair enough. I think the, the difficulty I have in responding to your question is the nature of the South African production system and the nature of the funding within that system. So I'm just going to respond very simply by saying that the IPR Act doesn't even engage with the notion that there might be ethical issues. It doesn't even think about that. And I think that is highly problematic. And one of the things I wanted to say, but you know, uh, just because of time I didn't, is that what we find is a very fragmented approach to the understanding of intellectual property. We've got an act which is not, it calls itself an IPR act. It's not an IPR act. Let's just be absolutely clear about that. It is a patent act. And the problem is that it actually misses loads of issues. It misses issues about how to disseminate knowledge in what is clearly a transition to a knowledge-intensive economy. So because we're not even at the starting point in the legislation, I mean, your, your issue lies several steps, <laughs> uh, several next steps beyond you know, where I'm sitting. And, and so that just, I think, um, in our research, we were grappling with the, the very foundations of the legislation and the institutional effects. Um, and I think we're, we're several steps away from getting to those kinds of more complex issues. Um, because if there was a, 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 an, a, a more systemic approach, other institutions that are completely out of the frame would be involved like the Department of Health. The Department of Health is not involved in this conversation at all. 
So, and I think what that suggests is that many very important stakeholders, those voices, and I'm just talking about very powerful players, I'm not talking about the voiceless. You know. So I, uh, what you're, you're, the way I want to respond to your question is that the IPO Act is not inclusive. We like using that word. Here's a real example of a, 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 a piece of legislation which is highly exclusive and plays a big role in excluding all kinds of stakeholders and all kinds of issues from a very important ecosystem. Thanks. There, there seems to be a lot of emphasis uh, in the studies of this type on the patent questions uh, that intellectual property is mainly being equated with the patents, with the traditional scientific research, etc., etc. Uh, that's one. Two, I think that there is a lot of a huge distinction between the patent-related kind of studies on publicly funded research on the one hand and the other innovations and creativity that are happening in our university. So if you go the patent way, you end up with the conclusion that uh, not really much is happening. But if you go up more broad-based and nuanced way of intellectual property, there is a lot that is happening. And uh, those of us who belong to the social sciences feel always uh, neglected and offended by such studies. <laughs> because I, I just want to, for, for example, Cite the study uh, by Caroline and others. At page 310, you say, UCT and VITS have both confirmed their institution's commitment to open access by becoming signatories to the Berlin Declaration. That leads me to the, my last issue, which is basically this. Uh, the nuanced way would say that the parameter for, access, for assessing whether somebody needs to have access or ownership or interest in the IP is did they do the work in the course and within the scope of their employment? And therefore, in, and what was the nature of the contract? So sometimes publicly funded research is not uh, that automatically there is no claim of uh, uh, access or ownership, if you want, but that uh, uh, tech, you know, uh, even Western, you, you, even American universities where these things are very strong, you will see that when it comes to issues of copyright, the person who has performed the study or who has written the novel, etc., etc., still has a lot of leeway. And there are so many nuances that we really need to look at. Lastly, which is really final, is that did you also check at the creative commons and whether this is being used in the South African universities as a model? Because creative commons, please let us know that it is not the free as in not owned but it is open in the sense of proprietary, but licensed. I think that there has been a lot of confusion on what Creative Commons means. We know there are so many Creative Commons licenses, but it is a proprietary system. Let's just accept that. So it's open, not in the sense of free, as in free software, but open in the proprietary sense that licensing regimes work, but work in a softer and better way. Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to very quickly offer some solace to Ben um, <laughs> in the sense that you're feeling really left out. But just as Lucy pointed out, the IPR Act is a patent act. It defines intellectual property and it specifically says it excludes copyright works. And so if we do a case study then based on that legislation, we are necessarily constrained and almost hindered from looking at copyright. So don't feel too bad. We are hard <laughs> copyright people, but this legislation drove us in this way. Um, the rest of your comments, um, don't really want to respond to them. Um, noted, um, huge debates. Uh, we couldn't possibly engage with all of that right now. I just wanted to pick up on something that Lucy said, which um, uh, when we were working on a program which was called in Innovation for Inclusive Development, where we were trying to link universities with community-based research, not, not, pub not privately funded research, so community interest. Um, we recognize that all over Africa, India, you know, South Asia, Latin America, there were many, many universities that were teaching institutions and not at all research institutions. No, in no way were they going to get there very fast. And I'm picking up on the point that you made. And one of the reasons why you distinguish the six universities in South Africa that tend to, uh, you know, get the public funding. So I think in the, in the act, and NIPRO needs to make that distinction, because I think the, the, the 
desire to patent something. I understand the desire to build capacity. And I understand the desire to transfer technology. But I think in the, act, in the act, there should be some understanding of the distinction between a research, a university which has added research to its mandate, and universities that really are teaching institutions, that really still have to explore what it means to research. And one of the places best to explore would, in fact, be in the community space where patents might, in fact, in fact, emerge. Really interesting research has been done with, you know, um, subsistence farmers and so on. Is it the desire then to capture this, to commercialize it? It belongs to those farmers. So the, the, this is big science. It's, 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 a, it's a model for industry-led research. And I'm, I'm worried that the as you said, the inclusivity of, this, uh, of, of the desire to capture value from the intellectual property in universities might actually be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I want to ask, um, um, do you feel there is a problem currently with the intellectual property law here in South Africa? And what's your comments? Uh, how can we improve the current law here in South Africa? And can it uh, be also taken in other African countries in relation to publicly funded research and even uh, innovation and creativity and bringing more research into, um, into Africa as a whole? I mean, what ca current holes there is in the, in the copyright system or even in intellectual property law? How can we improve it from your experience as a researcher? Thank you. Well, Rami, thanks for throwing a landmine at me. That's such a huge <laughs> question. I do not know where to begin. Um, but what perhaps is worth sharing is to say that there has been uh, an IP policy drafted and released for comment um, recently in South Africa. A lot of people in this room have engaged with that policy. And so whilst I think there's quite a lot wrong with the IP system in the country, at least there's an opportunity to fix things. And so what perhaps would be some of these things that are considered to be wrong? So for example, our Copyright Act is really outdated dates back to 1978, um, does not have adequate exceptions and limitations. And so we're hoping that that will be fixed. And you could just look at each of the pieces of legislation and kind of pick out certain things. Um, I wonder if I should perhaps ask other people from the floor who are South African IP lawyers who perhaps want to weigh in and tell us what they think is wrong with the system and what needs fixing. Um, and as I started question, that, I was looking, oh, Pamela, right. <laughs> in the sense that I find it fragmented. And apart from fragmentation, which originates from the way maybe it's implemented, one could also think of the fact that as the policy is being developed, the many departments that perhaps are not converging and speaking to each other on how they're going to move forward with the implementation. So as we think of the IP policy at the moment, maybe that's one thing that we need to push to move from divergence to convergence, and that will help us to have a proper policy framework that can speak to all the pieces of legislation. That's my one cent thought at the moment. Yeah. So if we can deal with the issue of fragmentation, particularly with the departments that deal with the IPs in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panelists and to the floor for your engagement with us. Um, there's just the one issue that I'd hoped we'd get to, but unfortunately we haven't been able to, so I'll give that to you and perhaps you can chat over it over biscuits and coffee. And this is the issue of formal versus informal collaboration. So I was hoping to ask my panelists at some stage um, what they found in their case studies with uh, respect to universities collaborating with the informal sector. But, well, we don't have time. And so I would just like to close the session by saying that um, a lot has come up, a lot that we need to engage with. Um, and just to, to cap it off, it's very difficult. Um, if you could see in my head, there's a word cloud in there. Lots of words, finances, benefits, um, societal impact, ethics, all of those things came up in this session. And I hope that we'll continue to talk about those things for the rest of the week. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.